got an amen from out here somewhere.
God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, thank you, choir, for that. And congregation, thank you. Let's approach these moments giving full attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit as He speaks. I have already announced to you that uh, we were going to look at the month of October as Revival Month. Typically we have revivals throughout the area the month of October. Sometimes we have them in the springtime and the month of April. And we haven't, because of the COVID situation, had one here. And uh, I'm not, uh, haven't asked a visiting speaker to come in. As your pastor, I'm going to try to guide us through this week and or this month, I should say, and let the Lord speak to each of our hearts. Uh, there's a theme that I'm going to give you this morning for the month of October. We will base our thoughts out of the 33rd Psalm, if you would like to turn and be looking there. I'm going to read one verse of Scripture but we will come back to the 33rd Psalm and explain that just a little bit more in the course of sharing with you this morning. Psalm 33, verse 8. The scripture says, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. The title of today's sermon or lesson or message is Regain the Awe of God. The theme for this month will be the regaining of all for God in each and every one of our hearts and lives. I'll do my best to try to explain that over the next few minutes and then guide us into this first uh, sermon uh, that will be followed by more here in the month of October. So I hope that you will come. I hope that you will pray before coming and that you will be blessed as you come and our hearts will be transformed and changed. There are many questions that are on our minds these days. I would not be able to give you a complete list of all the questions that might be asked from all of us who are here today. But certainly hitting the list of questions that we might all have would be these. Why is our world in such a mess today? Why are people so difficult to get along with? No one seems to get along these days, do they? There is so much turmoil and so much difficulty in our world. What is wrong with church life these days? People are leaving, not returning. They are not uh, coming as they once were, and they are not seeking the Lord as they once were. And of course, that big question that looms out there in all of our minds, certainly in mine, is the question of when will COVID and its, its effects be behind us? You heard me say already that I thought when we ended 2020 that we were looking at COVID in the rearview mirror, but here we've had it to resurface in 2021. Uh, what does that look like going forward in 2022, which is rapidly approaching because they're already talking about another variant that's coming and a wave that's going to be associated with that vi uh, variant. When will we ever get it behind us? I don't know the answer to that. I know that God knows the answer to that. But as we think of those questions, then let me challenge us in this regard. Do we ever confront the most serious question of all? And that question is this. 
is our heart right with God and do we recognize Him as we should in every area of our life? Do we really recognize God in every area of our life as we should? This past week, I was reading through and I finished a book entitled Nuts and Bolts of Deacon Ministry written by Alice Cullinan and Keith Dixon. In chapter 7 of that book, I came upon a section which just really gripped my attention. It really spoke to me. It dealt with people having a lack of awe for God. And God began to speak to my heart and I began to realize something that I had not realized in this particular way, at least not with these words. I became convinced that we need to regain the awe of God in our lives and that will go a long way to resolving a whole lot of issues in this world and a whole lot of things that we are dealing with these days. As a matter of fact, if we could regain the awe of God in our lives, I submit unto us that it would transform our lives. To help us better understand where I'm going here, as you know that I sometimes do, let me help you to understand the word awe. It is associated with the word fear in the Hebrew. And when you see it in the Old Testament, like we're looking at here in Psalm 33, then know that it is associated with the word that we refer to as being fear, but it has to do with a different type fear than probably what we most commonly think of. I really like the definitions that I uh, found whenever I went to the World Book Dictionary because it said of all these things, and I quote from the dictionary, great fear and wonder. That's what all is. Great fear and wonder. Fear and reverence. Having the power to inspire fear or respect. It is reverential fear mingled with admiration. It is all. Like, for example, if we use the phrase, the majesty of the mountains always all be. You ever been there and looked out over the mountains and you say, oh my goodness, what a sight to behold. You're in awe of the view that you are having. I think of things that have awed me over the years. I think of those days whenever I was flying in the military uh, going from my station up in Alaska to, to North Carolina back and forth in the times that I served up there. And I was always in awe whenever I had the opportunity to sit by the window, get a seat that I could sit by the window and I could look out and I could see the ground below. I remember when Rosalie and I went to Israel and I looked out that plain window and I could see the Swiss, uh, the Swiss Alps below and I thought, oh my, 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 how awesome is that to be able to see that. To fly over these United States and look down on a clear day from 36,000 feet in the air is an awesome sight to me. It is absolutely awesome to be able to see that. To go and, as I had the privilege to do, to stand on the top floor of the barracks when, where I was stationed there in Fairbanks, Alaska, and look out over the uh, uh, area there where I was stationed and see the panoramic view that was in front of me, I used to stand there and I would say to myself, there has to be a God. There is no way that there could not be a God because I am in awe of what I am seeing out here. It is absolutely so beautiful. No camera has ever captured the beauty of that, uh, that scene like the eye can capture whenever you see it in reality and see the beauty of what God has created. 
Whenever we were in Israel, I had the privilege and Rosalie along with me to walk the Via Dolorosa, as it is known as. That's the way of sorrow that goes through Jerusalem. And it is the path that Jesus walked going up to Golgotha's brow to give His life a ransom for all of us. And I thought, wow, it, with all, I am walking the very place where, as far as I know, history records that my Savior walked, bearing His cross all the way up uh, to Golgotha's brow. How awesome that was to have the privilege to be able to walk in that place. Then I had the privilege to go and stand at a point where I could view the place of the skull, the hill there, and literally it looked like a skull that you could see in the side of the hill. And they said, the guide said to us, it is up on that hill there that Jesus was crucified on the cross. And if you will take your view and you will move it right here, you will see the garden tomb where his body was removed from the cross and taken and prepared by Joseph of Arimathea and placed in this tomb. And by the way, you can walk into that tomb and you can see that it's empty today. I stood there with awe. I was so awed by that situation that tears ran down my face. It was absolutely a wonderful, wonderful experience for this little preacher boy. Beloved, this morning I have come to realize that people, except for a small majority, have lost reverential fear and admiration for Almighty God. And that's one of the reasons, maybe the primary reason, why we have all the questions that we have and we're dealing with all the issues that we are dealing with. I say unto us this morning, Oh, how we need to regain a profound awareness of God. Hence, this morning, I want us to look at what the Lord has spoken to my heart about. Of the three times that the word all is given to us in the Bible, and there are only three, by the way, of the three times, and we're going to, I'm going to give you two of those. I'm going to save one for a later message that we will look at. But of the two times that I will give you recorded in the psalm, which is 33.8, and you can also back up to chapter 4 and verse number 4, the word all is used and the suggestion from the psalmist is very strong as it says like in our passage this morning, stand in awe of Him. Stand in awe of Him. You and I need to stand in awe of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It would be quite interesting to note how our lives would be transformed if we would only find ourselves positioned where we were standing in awe of Almighty God and really seeing Him in all of His power and in all of His glory as we are able to see Him through the eye of faith today. The Bible gives us many examples of people who stood in awe of God. I started looking at those examples and boy, it stirred my heart. I'm going to give them to you this morning. Their awe, their awe of God was recognized as they respected His power and His position in yesteryear. All the heroes of faith that are mentioned in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews were those who stood in awe of God. Listen closely as I reel off to you a powerful list that comes from Hebrews chapter 11. Abel, for example, stood in awe of God as he offered his more excellent sacrifice over Cain. And when God accepted that sacrifice, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking as Abel stood there and realized that God had accepted it, he said, how awesome is God. The Bible doesn't record those words, but 
that must have been upon his heart and upon his mind as he thought about God accepting his offering. Enoch, whom I talked about just two or three or four weeks ago, Enoch walked with God because he stood in awe of God. And because he stood in awe of God, God took him and took him right on to heaven and translated him into his wonderful presence. Noah was moved with fear and he prepared the ark because he was in awe of a command that God had given him. For God told him, I'm going to destroy this world with a flood. I want you to build this ark. I want you to build it 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, three stories I want you to make it. I want you to pitch it within and pitch it without. And Noah went to work doing that because he was in awe of many things, one of which must have been the fact that God had chosen him to be the vessel who would build that ark. But he was in awe of the fact that God was going to destroy all of creation here upon this earth with a flood of waters that was going to come. And he believed God. He was in awe of God. He believed God. And he prepared that ark for the saving of himself and his family. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees the Bible says, looking for a city which had foundations whose builder and maker was God. And he was standing in awe of that God, looking for that city that he wanted to be a part of because he was in absolute awe of Almighty God who had spoken to him and said, Look, I'm going to make of you a great nation. Your seed will become as the sands of the sea, and I will give you a place in which to dwell. Don't you think that would have made any person stand upright, very, very straight, looking upward and saying, Yes, Lord, I'm in awe of your majesty, and I'm in awe of your power. And Lord, I am in awe that you would see fit to choose one like me, to be the father of a great nation. Isaac, the son of Abraham, undoubtedly stood in awe before God after being placed on that altar there on the crest of Mount Moriah, believing that his father who stood over him with a knife raised ready to take his life, he thought that that was going to happen. But when God said, wait a minute, Abraham, I know that you trust me. I know that you have an all for me. Take your arm down and take your knife and put it aside and look behind you. There's a ram caught in the thicket there behind you. And Abraham turned and he took that little ram and he brought it and he placed it on the altar there. And he got Isaac up and Isaac was standing there and I bet his eyes got about this big as he was saying, my goodness, I thought that was going to be me. But God has provided and my father has said, God will provide himself a lamb. And indeed he has. And Isaac stood there in awe as his father offered that little ram on that altar as a sacrifice to God. After dreaming his dream in which he encountered God at Bethel, or Bethel as we refer to it, Jacob said these words, How dreadful is this place! The word is translated from the Hebrew as dreadful, but you know what the word really means? Awesome. What it really means is awesome. And Jacob was saying, How awesome is this place! This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Genesis chapter 28, verse number 17. The troubles of Joseph and his ultimate exaltation no doubt positioned him to stand in awe of Almighty God. No doubt along the way he wondered, How in the world can this be happening to me? When is it all going to be over? Why in the world didn't the chief butler remember me and say something good about me and I'm left here in this prison? All of a sudden one day he was remembered and he was brought forth 
And God used him miraculously to say unto Pharaoh what needed to be said. And Pharaoh enthroned him to be second in command in the land. I have no doubt in my mind that Joseph, in that position there of being second in command in Egypt, looked toward heaven and said, God, I am in absolute awe of what you have done in my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you over and over and over for what you have done in my life. I am in absolute awe. After her deliverance from Egypt, Moses and the Israelites expressed their awe to God as they sung a hymn unto Him. And that hymn is recorded for us in Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Joshua and all of Israel, undoubtedly that day when they marched the seventh time around the city of Jericho, which was their first encounter as they entered the land of promise that God had given unto them. And on that seventh time they marched around and Joshua said unto the priest and those that needed to blow, he said, now blow on your horns. And they blew on their horns and those gigantic walls around the city of Jericho came tumbling down and those people stood there, no doubt, saying, What just happened? What in the world happened? What, we are speechless. What happened? Joshua says, Israel to the spoil. Go ahead to the spoil. Give God the praise. Give God the glory. Honor Him. Stand in awe of God because this has happened because God has made it happen. And they were in awe of the power of God that day. Last but not least, Isaiah was in awe of the Lord whenever he saw him in Isaiah chapter 6. And I talked about that recently as well. Whenever he saw his vision of God there on that particular day, he saw the absolute holiness of God. And no doubt he stood there and he too was, What am I seeing? What in the world is going on? What is happening? What is even happening to me? I see Him seated high and on His throne. I look into my heart and I see that I am a man that is undone and I am unclean and I am in the midst of an unclean people. He was in awe of God. Wow. He was in awe of God. Beloved, the list goes on. It continue, It can continue to go on and on and on. But let me get to a question that I want to raise and then bring us to a conclusion. Why should we stand in awe of God today? I can go on and on and give you more examples that are given to us in the Scripture, but what about us? How are we going to be impacted? Why should we stand in awe? Because after all, beloved friends here at Benham this morning, we, like the patriarchs and many others of the past, should also find ourselves standing in awe of the Lord that we serve. There are so many things about Him that should fill us with awe. Hence, we return our attention to the 8th uh, Psalm that we, or the 33rd Psalm that we have here before us this morning. And I want to point out a few things to you about why we should stand before the Lord in awe. Consider these things that are named here by the psalmist. Look, first of all, at the fact that we should find ourselves in awe because we know that we have been made a new creation in Christ and we have a new song to sing unto Him. Well, that's what the psalmist said in verse 3. Sing unto Him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. That's talking about praising God. Whenever I think about what I was without Christ, and I think about what He has done for me, one so undeserving. I find myself standing in absolute awe 
that he could, he could take me and make me a new creation through the inworking of his power and his spirit in my own heart and life. And that's why I am able to sing today, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That's why you are able to sing that. And when we sing that song, beloved, we should be exalting the name of the Lord Jesus and from our hearts all and praise should be rising upward to Him. His Word and its power to enlighten and convert should fill us with awe. Look at what the psalmist said in verse 4. For the Word of the Lord is right, and all His works are done in truth. Verse 6, By the Word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of His mouth. It was His Word that convicted me of my sin. It was His Word that convicted you of your sin. After receiving Him as our personal Savior, it's been His Word that has guided me all these years. It is His Word that guides me today. It is His Word that should be guiding you today. It is His Word that I have before me on a regular basis in my study and I have it open there, and I am reading it, and I am studying it, and I am praying for the enlightenment of the Lord. And the Lord speaks, and the Lord provides, and I sit back in my chair in absolute awe that God could speak to this little preacher boy in the way that he does in the quietness of an hour there in my own home, in my own study. His Word is just that powerful to speak to my heart. I am in awe of His Word. I am in awe of His perfect works. I am in awe of His righteousness and His fair judgment. The last part of verse 4 says, All His works are done in truth. The first part of verse 5 says, He loveth righteousness and judgment. Verse 7 says, He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. I'm in awe, as the psalmist was in awe, of how God could do that. And therefore he said, Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Go down to the ocean or the beach. We Baptists call it the coast. Go down there to have a vacation and look out there and what happens? If your heart is right with God, the times that I have been there, I look out and I see that vast body of water and I look at it with absolute awe saying, God has to be the Creator. God has to be the Creator. No one, no one could do that. No earthly individual can do that. God has to be the Creator of that which I am able to enjoy. His loving kindness and His genuine goodness that He talks about in verse 5, the latter part, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, should fill us with all. Think about it, beloved. In the midst of all that we are experiencing, in the midst of all the questions that we have, still, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord, so says the precious Word of God. It is everywhere. If we would just simply be in absolute awe of the Creator, things would be very, very different, I suggest, unto us. In His goodness, beloved, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, these words, he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Sometimes when the earth is so parched and we're in such need of rain, the grass is dying and the earth is cracking, I begin to think in my mind, Lord, when are you going to send the rain and do we even deserve it? Because we have so many people in this world today who, when the first drop of rain starts, like may happen this coming week, the Lord willing, 
the very first thing that you hear out of a person's mouth, no matter how parched the ground is. I sure wish it wouldn't rain today. I just hate that it's raining outside. And this little preacher boy is saying, you don't realize the awesome power of God and the goodness of God who is willing to send rain on the just and on the unjust. We need to stand in awe of our God. We need to be awed by Him and His power. His power to speak and His bidding be done should fill us with awe, according to verse 9. For He spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. His faithfulness should fill us with awe. Verse 11, The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, forever, forever. The thoughts of His heart to all generations. His faithfulness should fill us with awe, for He will never, ever, 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 and I could keep on going, fail in any respect. Amen? Never fail. That ought to put us in awe of the God that we serve today. Verse 12, His choices should fill us with awe. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. I mentioned Abraham a while ago being the father of the children of Israel and God placing His hand upon Abraham and saying, I will bless your seed and I will multiply them. You remember what I said about that. You see, God made that choice. And the fact that He made that choice causes me to be in awe of Him. That He was willing to do that. And He was willing to make the right choice. But I bring it on down home a little bit further. I'm in awe of the fact that God has blessed these United States of America the way He has. And He has chosen to do that. I just don't know how much longer we're going to reap those blessings. If there's not a change, and if there's not a revival that brings people on their face before God, crying out unto Him for forgiveness of sin, and saying, Lord, help me to regain the all that I once upon a time had for You, and may the regaining of that all in my own heart be an all which is contagious that it goes uh, throughout the congregation at Benham and into the community at Benham and everywhere we go and other people capture that contagious awe of God and revival spreads throughout the entire area across the state and across these United States because people regain an awe for God. Finally, his unsearchable riches should fill us with all. Paul talked about that in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 8. He talked about the unsearchable riches of Almighty God. Included in that list of things would be the riches of His wisdom and knowledge from Romans chapter 11, the first part of verse 33. The riches of His grace, Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. Beloved, the riches of the grace of God is evidenced in His love and His mercy toward you and me. Whenever I think of being a recipient of the grace of God, I find myself standing in awe. I'm not worthy. I am absolutely not worthy to be a recipient of the grace of God. Grace, by definition, is unmerited favor to the ill-deserving I was a part of the ill-deserving. I do not deserve to be a recipient of the grace of God. But because of His riches, His unsearchable riches, He saw fit one night to send the Holy Spirit into my heart and life and to convince me of my need of a Savior. And as humbly as I knew how as a young boy at the time, I bowed my head and I said, Lord, I know I need a Savior. I want you to save me. I want you to come into my heart and live in my heart and direct me and direct my life so that my life will be yielded to you all the days that you have for me to live upon the earth. 
And I must mention the fact that a part of the unsearchable riches of the Lord that fill me with awe are the riches of His glory that I don't yet know about. I don't know what's out there in the future, but I'm anticipating some wonderful things. I hope you're anticipating some wonderful things. You see, I already know this morning that I'm enjoying and able to enjoy eternal life. How could that be? I stand in awe of the fact that a little country boy like myself could be endowed with eternal life through a matchless and holy God and His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That eternal life, beloved, means that I'm going to be able one of these days to enjoy my eternal home forever and ever on the other side. I have no idea what that home is going to look like. More and more now these days I'm thinking about that home. I hope that doesn't mean I'm getting ready to check out in the next day or two. But I'm thinking about it more and more. I'm thinking about what the Bible says about that place that he's going to prepare. That new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven that John the Revelator saw with gates of peril and walls of jasper, with streets as transparent, but yet like glistening gold. I don't know how to picture that in my mind. I know what the Bible says, but every time I look at that, I stand in awe before God that He is there making a place for me. Call it a mansion, call it a home, call it a house, call it a corner, call it a cabin. You know the old song says, Lord, just build me a cabin in the corner of glory land. I don't know what it will be, but I stand in awe that the Lord would be preparing such a place for one like me. And He is preparing a place for you as well. We haven't seen it yet, but one day we will. My precious beloved, how can mankind not be in awe of such an awesome God? How in the world can we not be in awe of such an awesome God? I pray that there's not one among us that would say He doesn't all be. Are we meeting God's expectations in this matter of standing in awe of Him? Or are we missing them? And because we are missing them, we are missing many of the blessings that the Lord would be bestowing upon us otherwise. Moses gave a summary of all the blessings of God upon Israel if, if she would stand in awe of God. Listen to what Moses said in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verse number 12. And now Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God? Remember I told you that in the Hebrew the word fear is closely associated with the word awe. Moses is saying, fear the Lord thy God. You know what he's really saying? Israel, Stand in awe of God and have a reverential fear for Him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and being. Walk in all His ways and to love Him. Serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and keep the commandments of the Lord and His statutes. That's the Lord's requirements. They haven't changed since Moses gave them to Israel writer of the book of Hebrews in the New Testament was of the same mind, in my opinion, whenever he penned these words. And he said, Let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. Godly fear means we stand in awe of the Lord 
And the psalmist said, let all the inhabitants of the, uh, of the world stand in awe of him. Beloved, if your awe of God has diminished, I want to call you to prayer right now. I want to call all of us to prayer. But for anyone whose awe of God has diminished, I want to invite you to bow your head right where you are. You can come up here if you want. You're welcome to. But you can bow right where you are and begin this month of October by saying, Lord, I'm sorry that I have missed being in all of you and expressing reverential fear toward you in my life. Please forgive me, Lord, and help me to regain that real awe of you that I should have in my life. You can pray that prayer, beloved. And you see, here's why it's so important to do that. Your influence on others and your witness for Christ will increase exponentially when you do that, along with the fact that your all with God will also increase each and every day as you live the rest of your life for Him. Now with me as we pray. Father, the time has come for the invitation number. The service now is in your hands. The message is there for you to use and your Holy Spirit to use for your honor and your glory. Indeed, you thrilled my heart in the study as I was preparing. Father, I pray that you will use the feeble way in which I have presented your word still to be a powerful expression on your behalf, one that you can use for your honor and your glory to transform our lives beginning right here at home at Benham and reaching out through the airways via YouTube and Facebook and other ways that we're able to reach out. May this message grip the hearts of people and change their view of you and cause them to position themselves to stand before you in absolute awe of your power, your wonders, your majesty, and your greatness. You, Lord, are awesome. And it's in your name we only pray. Amen.